Hey guys, it's guys, welcome to this special video of Maxi Aspie and today you will be seeing most of the speeches that I did last year. So on whole last year I did 25 speeches. Some of them I could record, some of them I couldn't due to data protection and the requests from the companies that obviously I've done a speech for. However, the ones I did film are in this video today and I want to say thank you for all the companies I worked with last year. Speaking at their events, it always means a lot to me, advocating at their events. And I just obviously continue the work that I'm doing around the autism ambassador role at the moment. So in today you won't be seeing all full speeches, but you'll, see, you'll be seeing clips of those speeches. As last year on the channel I announced I wouldn't be putting full speeches up anymore, but at the end of the year I'll be doing a compilation video to show some of those speeches. Obviously we're now a little bit later on in 2022 and um, still haven't uploaded that video yet. So today you'll be seeing all the speeches that was filmed, that I was allowed to film and seeing them in today's video. So the companies I did have the pleasure of speaking at and being able to record was Powered 4 TV, A Second Voice, BBC Radio Berkshire, The Diana Award, Southwark Independent Voice, Centalk, the National Autistic Society Enfield branch and Tortoise Media. So guys, here is the video. Hope you enjoy and thank you for watching as always. Here is the video. How are you, my friend, and uh, on, this, on this busy week for uh, WrestleMania? I mean, yeah, very much looking forward to it. Um, it's... Uh, I would say it's actually been one of the most sort of unpredictable uh, manias for, for the last sort of couple couple of years. I mean, normally by Royal Rumble time, we sort of know what direction it's going. I have to say I, I guessed the winner this year, which um, which is always sort of a target of mine. Um, but obviously then Brian coming in for, for the main event as well. Um, we we could be getting a repeat of WrestleMania 30. We we might not be. Um, so it it's took a, a, a slightly different path in, in that respect. Um, the same with the Universal Championship. You know, if you just said to me before Royal Rumble that Bobby Lashley was going to be heading into WrestleMania as the <laughs> the Universal Champion, I I wouldn't I wouldn't have believed that. Um, so both. World Championships, I think, have took a took a slightly different path to to where I thought they were going to be, um, and obviously things that I have enjoyed over wrestling, things like the Hurt Business, is now I think yeah. it's probably one of the best things sort of going um, has now been broken up, established. So um, yeah, it, it's a very interesting Mania card, and for me, you know. I think being an Undertaker fan, you know, this is probably the first year where I've just said, actually, no, he's, he's not going to be here this year. Um, as all the other years have just been, I mean, even the year that I went to Mania, which was 35, and I, ironically, he didn't turn up. I was luckily enough to be there the next night for Raw mm -hmm. um, and see him. Um, so I sort of caught the dead man gimmick the the uh, before he, he, you know, retired and and left his boots in the ring sort of thing so um yeah but this year is it is going to be sort of i think odd and i think the last two manias because of the pandemic without we've been able to see these sort of legends step away a bit more um and let let the the younger talent sort of perform and, and fill the void i know we had seen the last year in the bray wyatt match goldberg was still sort of hanging about um but this year there's not really any sort of legend, you know, part-timer, so to speak, on the card. So it, it's going to be interesting, really is. So autism in schools, colleges and employment. Over 70% of mainstream teachers disagreed that their initial training adequately prepared them to teach pupils with a range of special educational needs in mainstream schools. So it's not like the um, teachers don't want to teach SEN students. 
I think sometimes it does come down to the training as well. And some of the, well, 70% of them have, have disagreed that their initial training has prepared them for all that. So I think there's some key areas of where school and especially mainstream schools still lack that understanding, that awareness and that knowledge to actually support people with conditions that come into the schools. And obviously they agree with that statement because they felt that the initial training wasn't enough to prepare them. So I think there needs to be a, a great deal to look into that. 40% of children on the autism spectrum have been bullied. And in addition to this, 56% of, uh, percent of parents of children on the autism spectrum who have been bullied said that it caused their child to miss school or even change schools. So, you know, you've got 71% of children who with autism who are attending mainstream schools. But then if you look at the statistics, 40% of them are probably being bullied. And then 56% are probably not going into the school or even have to change schools eventually to an SEN school to sort of get the support that they need and they deserve. Um, I think there just needs to be a lot more knowledge and awareness around autism in schools. I think the teachers need to get the, obviously the training that they deserve to be able to do, do their jobs in mainstream schools. I think the education books sort of needs to be rewrote to actually educate people um, not only teachers but students that are at the school about autism and how we need to be more kind to each other and more supportive uh, so we can avoid things like bullying happening um, in the school environment but also online as a lot of it is sort of moving to the online environment now as well so even if they're missing school it still could be happening even when they change schools um, and we already know that autistic people are more likely to feel lonely, they're more likely to have thoughts of suicide and they also are more likely to have other uh, comorbid um, conditions and, and mental health issues. So, you know, we really need to sort of, I think, stop the bullying, get the training and get the awareness and also get the students to recognise what autism is and how, and how they can help. So people always used to ask me, you know, what was it like growing up with autism and then going through puberty? And it was quite difficult, I'd say, because I think with schools or the school that I went to, it didn't teach me a lot about, I mean, sure, it taught me a lot about sex, edu sex education and, and everything else, but it didn't actually sort of tell me how my feelings were going to change, what was going to change with myself. And I always found that, quite difficult going through it for instance I always remember there was one family member I was really close to and then as soon as I hit puberty I just ended up hating them and I don't know why um, and it was very confusing at the time and you know you sort of get to the age where you're leaving school because I, I did hit puberty quite late and I, so I was probably in year nine year ten when I started going through puberty and you sort of think that you've got an idea of the world and how to socialize and how to act you know you're sort of still masking but you're you're you've got to a point where you feel a bit more comfortable and then puberty hits and it just sort of throws it all out the window um you, you know you have to learn new cues you have to learn new ways of, of thinking and interacting and sort of trying to understand yourself again you've spent so many years trying to understand yourself and you you know you you then go through puberty and you sort of have to do that again um and i always found that quite difficult really quite difficult and quite stressful a uh, situation to go through at a later age as well and so many people went through it a bit younger than myself that i was sort of the only person going through it at the time and that was quite difficult So people always think that my acting started, you know, 2013 when I started doing my small plays and my my um, little productions that I was doing or people then think, well, actually, no, he was doing YouTube shows and, you know, little soap operas in on YouTube, you know, in 2011 sort of time. So people always ask me, you know, when did I start my acting? Because even in primary school, I was never had the big part in a play, but I always had a part in, in productions and, and things and I really enjoyed acting and still do, you know, it's still a passion of mine, still something that I would love to do full time one day. 
but really my acting really started as soon as I joined school um, because I think with autism you have that element of acting you have that element of masking and it was something that I, I, I had to do to fit into society and, and try and learn skills and the ways that people interact with each other and the things that people say and the things that people do and I've also had to adapt to the environments that I've been in so all the way through school you know I was acting I was masking I was still me I want people to know I was still me I was still being my um I was still showing parts of myself and and, and everything else but uh, at the same time I was masking a lot to try and get through school um, and the same can be said when I went to a secondary school all the way in Reading you know my language changed you know the way I spoke changed very much um, and just it had, the way I interacted with people I really moulded into the environment that I was in and then all the way to my special educational needs school you know where actually at that point, I said, enough's enough, I'm not here to make friends, I just want to get on with my learning. And that was actually the best time I had in school, because I stopped caring what people thought, and I just wanted to get on with learning and, and doing the best that I could. And that's when the real me started to, to show and, and come out, and, and yeah, really started to find my place of, of where I wanted to be and what I was going to do with my life. of the action has been like and uh, we'll also talk uh, a little later as well about uh, what is happening uh, read the announcement by the new health secretary uh, Sajid Javid about what next and uh, the way it will look perhaps uh, by the time we get to July 19 all of that to be discussed a little later but in the meantime uh, it's uh, time to catch up with the Diana Award in fact, we're going to speak to a couple of people because first uh, is an actor, YouTuber, campaigner. Uh, now Max J. Green from near Newbury is an award winner. Uh, Max is going to be presented with a Diana Award uh, for his work to raise awareness of autism. It's the highest accolade a young person can achieve for social action. Uh, Max, congratulations to you. Thank you ever so much. So, it's a pleasure. So um, uh, how were you nominated? Uh, how does it all work? Uh, so I believe there's like 12 judges and basically the way that I got nominated was, it's quite a funny story. So I started doing quite a lot of acting um, about a few, well, a few years ago now and uh, an old teacher got back in touch with me um, and just basically said, you know, well, well done on what you're doing and we kept in touch ever since. And then through that, he, he put me forward for a role for the National Autistic Society which focused on employment and autistic people so he put me forward for the role for that and um, I got that role and then I became an ambassador for the National Autistic Society and um, carried on doing speeches from, from that point onwards and then he also put me forward for this award as well so um, you know he, he put me forward and and luckily I was I was one of the people people that win uh, that had won the award it's incredible i know it's uh, uh, from four isn't it it's all online isn't it uh, what about your campaigning how did you get into that when do you because people always say oh i'll do something about it but actually the the interesting thing is is when somebody does do something and they actually do say do you know what i'm actually going to do it i'm starting now so when was that decision what suddenly made you want to do it so the thing that really got me was while i was doing the, the national um autistic society campaign the campaign was around employment. And when I heard the statistic that only 16% of autistic people was in full-time work at the time, um, that was the sort of point for me where I thought, okay, well, that, just that number should not, not be that low. You know, for, for me, I think there's so many autistic people out there that care, have got the skills, have got the talent, have got the ability to... Um, to to give something and 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 work and and 
everything else. And, and that, for me, was the point where I was like, well, you know, with my acting, I thought to myself, I want to be an actor. And I thought, well, we'll get off your bum and do it. And then I went on to Holby City and Doctors and, and was main characters on those shows. But then when this came up, I thought, OK, no, it's, it's time that I speak about my experience with autism and OCD and ADHD and epilepsy and also try and be a voice for for people that, that can't speak up and also just be the voice of of reason, understanding and, and acknowledging autism really and that's sort of when I started doing the, the speeches at events, universities, schools and mainly up in Parliament as well. Because when you say 16%, that means 84% was struggling to get uh, full-time work. So have you personal experience of that? Uh, you know, set aside, obviously, the work you've done, say, in Holby and, and, and Doctors, but nevertheless, in general, when you've been going for jobs, has it felt like something, there was a barrier there? Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the biggest barrier for me, I mean, I've been in workplaces where, for instance, I find it very helpful to wear, for instance, headphones in the workplace because it sort of blocks out that, that noise and it allows me to concentrate. And I've been in work situations where I've asked for that and I've seen other people wear them. And to me, they're saying no because I'm in probation, but so-and-so can wear them because they've been at the company seven years sort of thing. Um, and I think as well when when the national autistic society done a survey a lot of employers actually admitted that they wouldn't hire somebody with autism because they didn't know how to help or support them and when i've gone to job interviews as well i found sometimes i've mentioned that i've got autism and it's sort of a a put off from from the get-go that, that the employer has sort of lost that bit of interest because they they know it's going to be or they think that it's going to be a lot of a lot of work and a lot of support when in actual case it, it wouldn't be. Um, so I've, I've had experiences where I haven't been supported in the workplace, but then I've also had the, had the privilege and the honour to work with some great companies as well, and I'm quite fortunate, I think, to be to be in that situation. Um, but, but yeah, there's been experiences where I don't feel I've I've had the help or support, and at interview stages as well. Um, employees haven't been so accommodating and and supportive as, as what they could have been. It's all about knowledge and uh, I suppose um, information, education, and uh, that's where you've come in. That's why you've uh, won the award. You're looking forward to it from four. <laughs> it's quite something, isn't it? Honestly, it, it, it doesn't feel real. Um, when I literally remember the, my my former head, uh, former deputy head teacher sent me a text going check your emails and I had a look and I had this email from from the Diana Awards and yeah it's such a prestigious award and it and for me you know I, I can never I know that I, I do this this work and, and everything else and, and my main mission is just to raise that awareness and and the understanding but when you get a an award like the Diana Award and you're sort of recognized for your for your work um you know it, it can't can't put it into words really how how much it means especially you know like that is basically what like, diana was you know it's what she represented you know it's what she what she stood for was was justice and 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 yeah to, to have that award bestowed upon me is, is very yeah very humbling and very very honored to have it well, congratulations, uh, deservedly so, Max. Thank you very much indeed. Max Shea Green there being presented with his Dine Award today uh, for his work with autistic people. Uh, it's uh, going to be uh, live at uh, 4 o'clock on uh, YouTube, and he's, he knows a thing or two about YouTube. Uh, we're going to speak to another Dine Award winner in just a moment. Uh, once we've heard from King on BBC Radio Berkshire. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as parents, teachers, family and friends, we have an obligation to care for our children in ways which clearly show our children that we value them. They, in their turn, will then learn how to value 
themselves. Social campaigners. For the youngsters setting their own homework. 21! Inviting loneliness to lunch. Changing prejudice mind and standing in bullying's way. This is for the role models. The volunteers. And the people's princess. This is for the change makers. This. 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 Is the Diana Award. So yeah, I mean, thank you for having me on. Um, the Diana Award means a lot to me, you know. I, I've won it because of all my speaking and spreading awareness towards autism. You know, I'm an ambassador for the National Autistic Society, Dimensions UK, and now ambassador for Diana Award as well. Um, and it just it means a lot to me, you know. That's what Diana stood for, was, you know, speaking up about things that do matter, that are going to make a difference and you know justice and just being being the way that diana was you know she she stood up for all, all of those reasons and for me you know what made me realize for me that i needed to stand up for for my story about autism and for autistic people is you know that when i started the national autistic campaign which i was originally casted for just as a, an autistic actor was that there was only 16% of people in full-time work with autism and that hasn't changed for 10 years and for me to be in that position of where I was employed and did have a job and to know that there was loads of other autistic people out there that didn't have that opportunity or those chances by employers that that was the bit for me that I thought that needed to change you know I've been through the educational system where I've been through mainstream schools um, all the way to special educational needs schools and then all the way to colleges and, and in employment and each of those environments have been tough so for me when I started to do my ambassador work for the Autism Society and just doing things independently as well it, it meant it meant a lot to me to be able to get to get that done. I then started a YouTube channel as well called Maxi Aspie, so I, I do weekly videos on there raising awareness uh, towards autism, and I also do acting, so I've been on shows like Holby City and Doctors and been able to have great opportunities on there playing autistic characters and spreading that awareness as well in, in main character roles for those episodes. So I think it's really important that we, we spread awareness towards autism, um, not only awareness but also that knowledge and understanding is really key um, and you know to be recognized and receive a Diane award because of my my work and efforts have, have, has really meant a lot to me you know to to win the award it's the most prestigious award that a nine-year-old to a 25 year old can win um, and to be a recipient of that just means an, an awful lot you know to even be in the same sort of line up of, of these other recipients that have won the Diane Award and being the being the category of her, even her name, you know, means a lot to me. So um just really honoured and really proud to have, have received that award for, for my work.
got uh, many thanks, Max. Your insights are much appreciated and lots of thank yous. Um, so Sabrina's asked, could you go into, I think I missed a question actually. Oh, sorry. There we go. Max, would you consider developing a webinar like this, but directed to children as young as nine, please? They would listen to you much more because you are a YouTuber. Thanks. I actually agree with that. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, something that I, I I work at a school as well, so it's something I really want to tailor to the kids here um, because, yeah, a lot of them are growing up and they might not understand, you know, what is to come. Um, it'd be interesting to see how how old um, your child is as well. Um, that that'd be really interesting because obviously I'd, I'd I'd absolutely be I'd love to um, love to do one that's tailored to maybe a younger age as well um and just let them know what's coming you know what is to come because yeah it, it can it, it it does get more worrying it does get more more scary as as it as it advances so it's just sometimes about preparing them as well um mm. and having that sit down i mean it's it's funny because we do it for everything else we do it for sex education you know we do it for leaving school but like the gaming and the social media thing we don't really focus on, OK, well, this is what's going to happen. Uh, this is what employers are going to be looking for. Like a lot of people will just put things on their Facebook and not not think that in, uh, potential employer is going to go on their Facebook and have a look at what they're posted. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Would, would love to love to do one that's tailored to, to younger, younger people. I think that would be amazing because often coming from parents, it's just like, oh, it's mum and dad, you know, <laughs> who wants to listen to them? I, but coming I know from what you someone, mean. you know, a YouTuber as well, they're more likely to listen because you are just, they're, you know, it's more influential than your parents because everyone knows their parents are going to tell them not to do things. Um, they just, it's, yeah. It's I always think the way, amazing. isn't it? It is, I know. But um, no, so I would got... absolutely be happy to. That'd be amazing. I mean, we we'll, we stay in contact anyway, but we'd love to yeah, absolutely. Make, you know, share that and get that to as many people as possible. Uh, oh, so could you go into ASD uh, special schools virtually um, and give talks on this? Yeah, again, it's something. So I do a lot of speeches at like universities and schools as well. Um, so it's it's definitely something that I would. I would want to do more often, especially, you know, with with everything that's happened during this year with the pandemic and everything else. A lot of people would have diverted more of their socialising online, um, you know, on gaming. Um, so, yeah, I absolutely love to. Um, you know, I try and do as much as I can now with the speeches. But obviously, I, I, I love talking. I love raising that awareness and that understanding. So... Yeah, would would love to go into more schools um, and and talk about it. And again, I think hitting that younger age group is really key as well because early intervention, yeah. I think, is so key um, for for not only autistic people but also neurotypical people as well. If we get them early on, it's it's really really sort of good, and and they have that mindset from the get go. Yeah, definitely. And you share, I mean, your website shares all of your work, doesn't it? I did write it in the chat yeah. earlier. Obviously. So if people pop over to uh, www.maxjgreen.com. That's um, the one, yeah. You can sign up there for your mailing list and things like that as well, can't they? So they get updates regularly. So as and when, you know, and your social media yeah. channels, your YouTube um channel they can subscribe Absolutely. to that so they can keep up to date with everything that you're up to and i do believe you just got awarded something didn't you max yeah so i was just awarded <laughs> um the diana award which is basically the most prestigious award that a young person from nine years old to 25 years old can can um accomplish so yeah it's um it, it for me it's 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 just really nice you know to sort of have that recognition have that have that have that award you know it's it's you know I do, I do all the work i do because i want to make the world a better place for autistic people for parents for teachers um and to have an award like that you know is 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 amazing you know you just you don't expect it, really it. i think my, no. i think when i was growing up you know playing video games my mum probably thought he, you know he's never gonna have a, a diana award but you know about 10 years you know 15 yeah. years later 
you know so yeah it, it it's it's mind-boggling to me you know and it's still something I, i'm going to carry on not get complacent with and, and just carry on sort of trying to raise that awareness Hmm. So I thought it might be sort of fitting to ask um, if you feel comfortable, would you like to share a bit about your diagnoses and what your experience has been like coming to learn about nah, them? Nah. Um, I thought it might set the No, no, absolutely. So I've got autism, ADHD, OCD and epilepsy. And I always make the joke of saying that the doctor just loves to give me conditions. Um, I mean, I've always known that I've I mean, I can't really remember a time where I didn't know that I had my conditions. I was sort of always sort of made aware of them by my parents, you know, that um, I think the first way that my mum explained it was, you know, my, my brain works like this and everyone else's brain sort of works like that. And while mine's still going, that one just worked. And, it, and that's how I was sort of first explained autism um i think because there was such a sort of lack of knowledge as well around autism mm. um and i think every parent will find this the parents all sort of automatically become the experts because they're, they're always challenged with, by the fact that there's no one really around them that that are able to help them or or, or understand it and that was sort of my mum um you know i couldn't speak till i was six either so you know the telltale sign for my mum was the fact that i could just pick up a game and play this this game and 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 know my way around a map but i couldn't then you know communicate with my mum till i was six and she always just thought mm, there's something something there you know something um that's stopping him from from being able to to sort of communicate so I think, you know, my autism diagnosis was the first. And I always say to people that I think the the one thing that the sort of medical system gets wrong is they're very, they take very, very long to diagnose you with a condition. But in my experience, the minute you get a condition, they're very quick to diagnose you with other labels. And they're very quick also to prescribe medication because a little bit later on, I was diagnosed with ADHD and they decided to put me on medicine for that um, instead of doing any sort of therapy or anything that, that could be more helpful than just, you know, here's, here's some medication, try this. Um, so, and I always try and speak about medicine because the medicine in the end gave me uh, a form of Tourette's. So I had tics um, and obviously growing up in, growing up in school being all ADHD and then having six wasn't uh yeah hard enough making friends already let alone having something else and then I found out I had OCD that was at primary school as well so all around the same time and then later on in life I got diagnosed with epilepsy um I was at college at the time um and I was upstairs in my room and then I just had a had an epileptic fit and that was when we found out I had I had epilepsy as well. Um, the doctors later said after that that could have been caused by uh, medication um, that for my ADHD, because apparently it does lower the threshold of you having a fit. Um, so this is sort of why I always speak a little bit about medicine, because I always think if you can do anything to prevent medicine before you get to that stage, I'd always recommend it because the side effects can be quite bad um and can lead to other things um so yeah i mean those are my diagnoses as of as of late uh, <laughs> you know it's not changed for a little while now so um hopefully you know there's there's none other surprise ones coming in but um but yeah you know as i say i i learned very very early on luckily my mum did get into the position where we could get a, a formal diagnosis and educational health and care plan in place before 
I sort of went 20 or 30 years, you know, as some people do without getting that diagnosis. So, um, yeah, I think I was very fortunate there to, to sort of have, have that in place. A bit about my acting and producing experience as well. So while I was at um, my first, well, actually no, it was during I was, it was actually when I was at college. Um, I, I I was watching EastEnders and I just said to myself, wouldn't it be amazing to be able to tell a story and it go on air every night and someone takes something away from it. Um, and I said, I'd just love to be able to do that. And I, I just said, well, get off your bum and do it. So I started some small plays, um, and I mean really small parts. I mean, like one-liners. Um, my mum even fell asleep in one of the plays. Um, true story. She's out for the count. Um, but I I just had such passion to to want to do it. And... I got a gig up in Newbury um, and that was for the passion. Um, it was, it, it was, it was unique. The, the play tried to do a modern sort of Jesus, but in today's world. And unfortunately there was a line that says that Jesus doesn't rehearse. And it, it was quite true because the, the actor that was playing Jesus kept getting his lines wrong. Um, so it, it was a bit, yeah, yeah, quite ironic. Um, but, and then my mum fell asleep, so that topped it off. Um, but I only had one line, so, you know, all was forgiven. I'm not bitter. Um, but from that, I then done another play up in Newbury, and the makeup artist that was on that show, she said that she was doing the makeup for Glue, um, which was a TV show on E4 at the time. And she said that they're looking for extras. Um, so I said, oh, you know, that, that'd be amazing. Um, and during this time as well, it was literally when I just accepted the job at my, my uh, the housing association, my first job. And my mum was trying to get me to take the bus and I was really uncomfortable with taking buses at the time. And I just said to my mum, no, nope, well, if I'm joining work, you're going to have to take me to work every day. And my mum just went, well, no, if you want to work, you're, you're going to have to get on the bus. Um, and it was literally to this this acting gig came up I said mum will you take me and she went no nope, if you want to get it you'll get the bus um and I kid you not it was probably I ended up getting the bus and I always remember my mum was my mum did give in right before she said I'll take you if you want and I said no mum I said you're right I got I got to do this and I kid you not I got on the bus I spilt coke down my trousers so it looked like I wet myself uh, they told me that I needed to get off near a monument and I must have passed about three on the way there. Um, when I got there, the person that was meant to be picking me up wasn't there. Um, when I got to the set as being an extra, there was a bloke in front of me with the same name as me. And they said, oh, are you Max Green? And he said, no, what kind of name is Max Green? And then I'm like right behind you and I'm thinking, oh, because I'm going to have to go up and say my name in a minute. Um, then I was asked to go topless um then they dressed me in a hawaiian shirt and shorts with, with sunglasses on and then the one guy that i was speaking to all throughout the day that i had actually a lot in common i ha was paying attention to nothing that he was wearing and then the director just said okay bring on the naked guy and the guy that i was talking to just undone his dressing gown and was he was the naked guy and i was like uh, oh my god um but while I was there, there was a rope separating the extras and the actors. And me being me, I just went over the rope and I pretended that I was, be, I was an actor that was joining next week. So people were coming up to me going, oh, who are you? And I'm like, oh, I'm Max. I'm playing Grant next week. Yeah. Uh, and they just believed it because the storyline in Glue was about someone that was just killed. So if... a new character came in and it was all low key 
which I basically said it was a bit low key at the minute. Um, they they just believed me, um, and from that I was able to get you know the details that I needed. You know, how do I know who is legitimate? How do I know who is not? Um, you know, how did you get your agent and and etc. Yolanta, I'm going to bring in Max, Max Green, um, who is telling his story in the chat. Are you there, Max? Hiya. Hi there, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Nice to see you. I'm just reading this. You, what happened to you? Was this when you were at school? Yeah, so when I was at secondary school, I went to a mainstream secondary school that had a um, ASD unit at the school. Right. Um, I had an educational health and care plan they thought that would be the best place for me and after a while I saw a lot of people that uh, was having issues in school would slowly get kicked out of the the um, ASD unit um, because they wasn't going to lessons because they were getting bullied or they were having issues at home and th those people would get kicked out or managed moved from the school and the people that did have conditions who uh, was doing well the ASD unit would keep them because I think for statistics and everything else it would look good for the school um, so I was then moved to a school up in Oxford which was a special educational needs school I was told it was a an autistic school when I was going there but when I got there it was it was a range of uh, people who went through very traumatic experiences all the way to people that had uh, anger issues, um, ADD, ODD, OCD. So it was a very range. Um, and even though the school was brilliant in its support, um, I was in a classroom of six and there could be like 20 fights in a day, you know, so, you know, the school had to positively handle people and it was quite a tough environment to be in. So educationally, I think I missed out on quite a lot, but the support I got at the school was, was second to none. Um, but the bad, one of the bad things about the school as well is they didn't do any GCSEs either. So when I left school, it was quite obviously hard to go out and get a job and um, go into the, the real world because you just suddenly can stops, um, you know, government help stops. And it's just like, oh, here's the world. There you go. And um, you're just sort of thrown into it. So um, that, that was a bit of, of my story and how I, how I found you know, school life and then going off into a, a special education needs school as well. Max, thank you so much for um, sharing your story. That phrase that you used, and I can see it in the, where well, you write it in the chat, when you were moved from the school you were at to the school in Oxford, it's called a managed move. Yeah. That's the name of it. And I'm interested to know when when that happened to you, did, 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 you, did they talk, did the people manage, managing the move, if you like, were there options? Like, did they talk to you about the school? That was, was your parents involved? Like, how did that all come about, that thing? So my mum and dad was called into uh, the school and I wasn't even aware of this at the time, but they basically told my mum and dad that um, this wouldn't be the right place for Max. If he stayed, um, he wouldn't be able to do any GCSEs. We, we really don't see a future for him here. Um, and the options would be basically a boarding school, which my mum knew that I would, I mean, at the time I, I found it very hard just to stay around a friend's house, let alone, you, you know, going off um, and staying at a boarding school, or it was this autistic school in, in Oxford. Um, obviously my mum was very upset at the time and it was very odd because um, I had a dream that I was moving school and I just woke up one day and I said, and it was all happening at the same time. And I, I said, mum, am I moving school? And um, we have this thing in our family. It's like take over for a promise that we can't lie about. So she said, no. And I said, promise me. And uh, she, she couldn't. So um, that's how I found out I was moving school. Um, and for the next, I'd say a month while I was at the school, I started going to lessons and even though I was getting bullied, I was 
go into the lessons because I desperately wanted to stay at the school. Um, and even with all that effort um, of going into the classrooms, getting bullied anyway, but still progressing um, by going into the lessons and everything else, they, they still managed to move me out of, out of the school. So um, you then feel that you're not wanted, that even when you did try, it wasn't good enough. Um, and you're very scared of what the future may hold because you're, you're going to go into this new environment which you, you don't know anything about. Going to secondary school is is a very nervous time for anybody anyway, let alone an autistic person. And then you have to make new friends. You have to shape that mould um, and try and fit in again. So it, it was quite tough. And then I think the, the final blow was obviously the GCSEs at that school anyway because the whole purpose of doing the move was to go somewhere where I would be able to take GCSEs and then I, I couldn't anyway. So it was sort of all sold as a as a sort of, you have to go because we don't really see a future for you here. Um, and if you don't go, you won't do GCSEs, but then I didn't end up doing them anyway. So it, it was, yeah, a bit like you ain't really got a choice. Max, did, did, uh, I'm going to come to um, some other people in the chat in a second. Perhaps we'll hear from Matt, uh, Timothy. But Max, just before we move on, did, did anybody in the school that you went to do GCSEs? Was it an option for anybody or did just the school just didn't do GCSEs? That just wasn't part of it? I think because of where everyone was, um, I mean, my, my fundamental belief is anyone should be given the, the option to do yeah. GCSEs because I just feel that you know, we, we shouldn't roll, we shouldn't rule out people, you know, just because they've, they've got a condition. And unfortunately, I think where the the school for everyone was, I think they, they thought it would be uh, uh, in better interest to get um, equivalent qualifications to, G, to for a GCSE as to go forward and get a whole fully pledged GCSE to the point and to the school's benefit as well. They have now changed that. So, um, I do speeches at the school now every now and again, and all the students do GCSE. So it's it's obviously something that they've learned from and obviously something that they've gone, actually, no, the, these people can do, you know, can do what neurotypical, um, you know, people can do. So um, they've obviously learned from that and and learned not to just to rule out someone because they've got a label or a condition. Um, it's just, as I say, it's just unfortunate while I was there, even though their support was absolutely top notch, the, the educational side there was just was not, let down a little bit by that. Yeah. Thank, Max, thanks ever so much. You've been super articulate and it, it paints a real picture. Let's bring in... Our Monday motivation for today is Max, who is a passionate advocate for autism. Here is more of his story. Have a great week and see you soon. Hi there, I'm Max J Green. I'm an Autistic Ambassador for the National Autistic Society. I'm also an expert panellist member for Dimensions UK, also an ambassador for wrestling travel and ambassador for the Diana Award and Diana recipient in 2021. I talk a lot about autism, OCD, ADHD and epilepsy, but my main focus to, is to get autistic people into full-time work, as currently there's only 21% of autistic people in full-time work. Also work with universities, colleges and Houses of Parliament, speaking about policies and changing them to enforce better support into autistic people's lives. So feel free to check out my website, it's maxjgreen.com and that's where I will have loads of events on there and also check out my YouTube channel Maxi Aspi where I talk about weekly subjects surrounding autism and other conditions. Have a happy Monday motivation guys.